Lunch is telling me that uh, you were asking me some good questions. <laughs> okay, so I need more to do. Higher wage. Okay, excellent. You said you're in the program, but you're not in my class. You don't like it. <laughs> Okay, because there's some people that I guess you're doing a third class online or something. Is that what are you doing an online class now? No, and I have time to do We're on the same boat. We weren't told to take another class. There's two classes. Oh, well, I guess I'll come back and take one of my classes another time. Absolutely. I don't teach again for a while, so I'll like maybe say the spring or whatever. But we're here whenever. And I think we're on YouTube now. Yeah. Yeah, like yes. that. Yes. That's what I hear. Yeah, I've seen you on YouTube. That was a good Are you enjoying the program? Or? Yeah. So far, it's a good Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Well, good. I, uh, I don't have cards. I don't play them. Yeah, well, but you should put my glasses on. I can read. Like, if you hold it in the back of the room, I can read. One of the kids at school the other day gave me something, and I, uh, that where he was? Oh. and he said, I, I have further, the app. A little further away. Oh, oh, away. Yeah. What's that? You see mine? <laughs> It's called Word. I can see that. Word Lens. Yeah, it's on the on the iPhone. Yeah, no, I just I, I knew that once I started wearing glasses, it would be uh, What is the app? What is it called? It's called Word Lens. Word Lens. Word. World Lens. So it's like a magnifier? It's a magnifier that will be translate. I don't know. I I don't I you look at my notes, I was like, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. You're so messy, all of a sudden. My notes? Oh, yeah. I'm going to do it. 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 I'm going he had like a little suite. A guy took over like 5,000 square feet there, and he's got like an office suite environment that he's going in. So that's why when I saw it, I, but I, I forgot what floor it was. Excellent. Why don't, well, I look forward to seeing you in class soon. Okay, bye bye. Hey guys, it's, uh, what's up? I mean, hi. Hey, you know. Good morning. Good afternoon. I mean, what's up with you guys? <laughs> Oh, I gotta put my voice on. Isn't it hot in here? Yeah, get that microphone. I need a mic. I'm, I'm gonna get it right now. Um, we're missing people. Some people have like abandoned me. Did Nicola quit the program? She couldn't hack it?
Actually, I'm not here. I can't see it. Here. I got, I got wearing a Ninja Turtle shirt. Holy. That's what I'm talking about. You should have seen my socks at work yesterday. Yeah, I think Ninja Turtle socks. Ninja Turtles. I had Ninja Turtle socks. Yeah. My boss is We're missing like four people. Um, Daryl, is Daryl here? Johnny, Johnny, Alex, Kulik. Um, who else are we missing? I hate the, I hate these computers. <coughs> I really do. I, I think they make it hot. I don't know what make. I I they might have just shut the air down because the temperature went down a little bit. I don't know. Whoa! This isn't working. Well, is it? Is it working? It's not working today, is it? There's Robert. Oh, dude, you went to get like a sandwich or something. Breakfast. Yeah, Starbucks line was so crazy. Yeah, with that walk, we you know we were waiting for a while. Dropped this a few times this week. Dropped this. Oh, we got a grilled cheese sandwich. Well, Steve Spurrier. Hello. Yeah, that's better, <laughs> right? And that's better, better, better. Hey, I don't like people all the way back there. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up, guys. I don't know. Just find your, like, we got spaces up here. Glenn, give up. Give up. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up. You take it back a little bit. Guys, there's no way. This is like church, dude. And I know, because I, like, I don't even sit in a pew. I sit, like, stand in the back. By the door. By the door. Where's, okay, there's Daryl. Where's Johnny? He's here. Where's Nicola? Where would you like me to sit? Seth? Well, if you could take, if you, why don't we? I don't want to block the camera. That's no, 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 no. But why don't we? Can we just like? With that pretty blue shirt. Thanks, man. Is that blue? I thought that's like when he's like pretty pastels. <laughs> it's like a teal. Yeah, pastels work for me, man. <laughs> Should skin tone, man. Can we? Watch, watch, watch it. Don't knock. I got it. Oh, yeah. But take it way, Alex. You're gonna have to go way back. Oh, you said, are you going to be now, I know, but I, <laughs> not, not way back, but a little back. This is as good as we can get. Yeah. No, what? You just took. Come over some more. I think this works. Yeah, make sure you raise your hand. I'm oh, napping now. I'm <laughs> what? I can't, yeah, I can't do it. I'm stuck. Come over. <laughs> What? <laughs> I'm so far away from my... Oh, you need your stuff, bro. Yeah, curl cap, man. What you got, curl cap? You got Do you? Good for you, man. Y'all the camera recorder, right? Yup. Mister, I'm fancy. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, if I, if I could have due diligence, guys, if I could have your attention, guys, ladies, ladies, as well. It's game time. Uh, phones off, computers off, eyes up here. I don't care if you're eating, but it's like it's game time. We got to get it together. Okay, a couple things. I'm going to have a guest speaker coming in right now. I'll introduce him as soon as he comes in. Uh, he should be here within the next five minutes, okay? So I think you'll have an interesting presentation. That's what we're going to focus on. This weekend, we're going to continue on themes um, related to diligence. So we've got a couple of case studies that we're going to work on, one in class later in the afternoon, or an assignment, I should say, more than a case study, similar to what we did last week. We'll break up into groups. We'll make some presentations. And another one that I'll introduce, and you guys will work on as a group and submit and present in the next class. Okay, so we'll just keep breaking down. There's plenty of themes to go over in the diligence realm, and we'll just keep exploring them as we go on. Uh, one thing I didn't do the other day is I didn't introduce myself, which just kind of started. Some of you have had me for some terms, know who I am, but others may not, and so. Just briefly, as it relates to diligence and it relates to this class, the experience that I have, I think, um, you know, which maybe brings a little bit of my perspective. One, some years ago, 
1999-2000, I set up a due diligence practice for Latin America for Ernst and Young. So I spent two years traveling through South America. Uh, we only did a couple of large real estate projects. It was more middle market type companies, but I, I looked at about two and a half billion dollars worth of deals. And so while the focus was to assist our clients in underwriting their transactions, they weren't focused exclusively on real estate. We had a lot more of business oriented items that we were looking at and operational related items that we were looking at. But ultimately it was financial diligence, okay? And so I've got some experience in that realm. The other one is the last big project I did when I worked at, at, at Florida East Coast was we did a $600 million 1031 exchange and it required us, again, to reinvest $600 million. That was all real estate focused. We did probably about 14, 12 to 14 unique transactions. And we did things from, we bought, I think, 60 some odd, I remember them were like 64 CBS triple net leases. That was like one sort of diligence that we had to do. But we bought uh, an industrial portfolio in Jacksonville, multi-asset portfolio in Jacksonville, bought a multi-office portfolio in Orlando in the Maitland sub, um, submarket. We bought office in Tampa. We bought office in suburban Palm Beach County. We bought land for development in Tampa. A lot of different diverse assets, some stabilized, some for development. Yes, sir? With this being a 1031 exchange, all of this was done within like 30 days? Okay, so the timeline on that is not, I, you were in the capital, no, you, you, you were not in the accounting class. No, I didn't think of it. So, oh, 180 days. Okay. Konya. Sorry. <laughs> Konya. <laughs> it's on. I turn it off. off. Oh. <laughs> Here it is. Okay. So, uh, Nicola, you've heard me say this three different times. Tell me the rules for 1031 again. You have 180 days. 180 days from what? That's for the entire process. 180 days from what? Let's start. 180 days from what? Time you see the money? No, from. Simple. From the time you close on a sale. From the time you close. Okay. From the time you close, 180 days to do what? To, to find a property and to acquire the property. Okay, so you have to close on a replacement property within 180 days. Are there any, any other dates of importance? You have to identify the properties? Within what, how many days? 45. Okay, so you've got 45 days. Is that in addition to or is that part of? Part, part of. Part. Okay, so you've got... And again, I always use the January, I closed on 1231, right? You've got till 215X2 to identify. Now, it's a whole bunch of rules. First thing is proceeds from this need to go into a? Escrow account. No, they need to go into a qualified intermediary. Okay, now that may be an escrow type account, but you have to go to a qualified intermediary. Okay, so proceeds go to the qualified intermediary. You identify within 45 days replacement property, potential replacement property, with the qualified intermediary. So that's who you're reporting to. And then you've got, what, 135 days to close. So on June 30th, or by June 30th, you needed to have closed. Okay, now when you identify, what can you identify? Like kind, like kind of property. Within 200, within okay, 200 okay. of what you actually have, something like that? I don't know. Like, did you pass the accounting class? I did. And I'm gonna ask that question again in this term, since we're going over it. It's gonna be in a it's gonna be in a quiz today. Uh oh. So learn it, because you really need to know this stuff. Okay. So when you identify, you say you can identify like kind property. What is like kind property? If you're gonna use that term, what's like kind property? Anything that's real estate. Anybody else who didn't take my e class? That's equal or, or greater in value. Okay, that's good. Yes? I used to think if it was an operating property, you have to acquire an operating property, but we did a 1031 where we acquired, you know, we sold operating property and acquired land. Hold on, this is our speaker. One oh, second. Okay. I... Not you. Yep. Where's the Bar County Library, guys? On the other side of this parking structure. 
So they're telling me it's on the other side of the parking structure from that. So like you're walking towards like Las, we're right on Las Olas. Yeah, we're right. The building is right on Las Olas. What's the address to this building? Is it like 111 East Las Olas? It's 215 East Las Olas. 215. 215 Las Olas. East Las Olas. East 215. Okay, we'll see you. Bye-bye. Okay, so, guys, Dustin's, Dustin's pretty much on. It's basically any, any real estate. I mean, in today's environment, it's, yes, sir. Is it commercial to commercial? Or could it be, could I sell operating property by one of the homes? That's what I was just yeah, yeah. As as well, as long as it's not a, a residence of personal use, right. right? Right. So as long as it's investment property, right, that you're going to lease, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, back to what can you replace? What did you say? It was something like 200%. What does that mean? Of the value, of the amount of money that you actually have. Of oh, the money that you have or the gain that you've deferred or the value or the total value of the property that you sold. I think it's the total value of the property that you sold. Okay. I think it's the gain. It's the gain. Okay, but when you say 200%, so how many properties can you identify? Unlimited. So you can identify an unlimited number of properties, right? Up to 200% of the value? I don't know that's Right? Is that what you said? That is what I said. Is there anything else that you can identify? Yeah, so if you're deferring a gain of a million dollars, just to say something, you can identify five replacement properties that total up to $2 million in value. Okay, now, you can also identify three properties, specific properties, right, with an unlimited value. Okay, so just three unique properties. So it's an either or type of thing? It's either or. Can you do both? No, you do one or the other. Yes. Do you have a, a master LLC? If you have a what? A master LLC. So if, a, if an, L, an LLC owned three properties, mm -hmm. if you sold one of those properties, a million dollar gain you're deferring, can you use that instead of purchasing a property, can you defer it and do a, you know, additional build outs or improvements on the other two properties. I mean, I think I, I think the answer to that would be no, because it's for reinvestment, right? Now, reinvestment is, I, I forget the specific rules, because you get into, for example, you can, you can invest the gain and reinvest it as a limited partner in another interest or as a co-owner in, in another entity or in another property. But I don't think that improvements would qualify. So you can co-invest with somebody else in a deal and roll that over if, if, if memory serves me right. But you can't reinvest in a property that you already have in the way of like leasehold improvements. If that's what you're asking. And you have to put down the specific address on the unlimited? Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to, ident you have to identify the asset. Yeah. So, and yeah, so the problem in that becomes that when you sell, you've got a very short window of time in which to identify. In fact, you needed to have been identifying or getting ready because the problem is the minute you close, the minute you close, you lose all your leverage on the buying side because people know you have to reinvest. And people know you've got a window. And people know it's like, oh, this guy's got, he's got hot money. He can't run away from me. You know, he's got a, he's like, he's got invested. So, I mean, we got caught in one of these with, we had some debt we were trying to assume. And it was CMBS debt. And we kept running into problems with a special servicer. And they didn't care. Because they knew, we, they knew we had to close, but we were going to have to pay tax on the gain, which he didn't enter like pay us off. Like, well, negotiate with us. They knew we had no, I mean, we had no leverage with them at all. Yes, Nicola? It's 200% of the gain, correct? <clears throat> correct. <coughs> it's 
<coughs> I'm not going to ask that on the quiz. It's outside the purview of this class. So. <laughs> You're not going to ask what? What he yeah. said he was going to. What you just wrote? I just made the quiz already. I, I'm oh, gonna, okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get into that. Let me see if I have any. Hey, let me jump off. Just I'm trying to gain some time. Some of the things. Um, some of you are in the strategy class, or all of you in the strategy class, or just some of you. It's all of us. Okay. Um, you have a project that you need to do on a, on a development, an industrial development in the airport West Market. DCT. DCT. Okay. And it's, that's right on 836 and like 130 something Avenue, something like that. So, I, Fred sir, you know, ran it by me. At one point, we were talking about jointly using that potential project in this class. But since it wasn't defined, I've gone ahead and, and just planned other things to use. The only thing I told them that I would do is, is the company I work for, our, our business was industrial and some office, but primarily industrial in the airport west and med medley markets. Just east of that park, and I think if you look at there, as they mentioned three or four competing assets. They talk about Beacon Lakes. Um, they talk about the former trade port which is where procacci has got some offices and, and they talk about Beacon um, Center and those were all properties that we developed. So I've got a little bit of expertise. I know you guys are putting something together for a third party. I'm happy to make myself available. I'm happy to help out to the extent that I can bring some insight. I, I don't know that I, I can't do the work for you. But if you want to know a little bit about the industrial market there, what moves it, what moves merchandise. I ran the trade zone when I worked for Kadena, which is just east of there as well. If you'd like, I've got a little bit of knowledge or information, so I'd, I'd like, just want to make myself available to the extent that I can be of, uh, of help. Nachi, I, I want you to meet Glenn, since you, he happened to be here earlier today, so. So, anyway, so listen, with it, come on up, come on up, come on up. Yes, sir. Um, you had mentioned there were uh, three competing centers in, over there. We got Beacon Lakes, Beacon Center. Beacon, Beacon, and then Tradeport. I don't know what trade, because Tradeport got changed to light speed, and what the heck's it called now? No idea. You know what I'm talking about? The thing that we did with Swordlow and where? 117th and 20th. Behind the Dolphin Mall. Yeah, yeah. They all change. So I know. I do you know what it's called now? You got properties there. We're in the, the crossroads office park. I know, but what's the industrial thing behind you called? That's the other other realm. That's the guy that sold you the land. Yeah. I'm something. It was trade port, but it's called something else now. I don't know what it's called. But if you have that DCT brochure, it talks about those and and it says like the former trade port or something like that. Okay. Do you have it with you? I think so, but I don't recall seeing that. Maybe it was in the email that the guy sent. No, it was in the write-up that the guy sent. <coughs> yeah, see, Flagler Station, Beacon Lakes. The LMB project, and it says Liberty's Trade Port, so I guess it's still called Trade Port. But so the other one is is Flagler Station, which is Medley, which is a it's a different submarket, really, and it has a different client base or tenant base. But one of the questions that Fred asks you guys is, does this fall within a trade zone? And the real question is, is that relevant or not? So to the extent you guys want some insight, I'll, I can make myself available. I'm not going to offer anything up. I'm here. I'm a resource. If you want to know. You know, call me, we'll set up a Google Hangout or whatever. I'm happy to provide some insight, okay? So, um, with that, I'm going to turn over the floor to a good friend of mine, Nachi Ignacio Portuondo. Uh, Nachi <coughs> has been in real estate for quite a lot of years. He worked at HFF at Holiday Fenoglio. Uh, he is now in charge of acquisitions for a, a private equity fund called Cofe Properties. And um, he's a good friend and he's a colleague. and. Um, partner, I guess, or a co-investor or something, something like that, I don't know. Like and I think Nachi brings a very unique insight to the realm of diligence. 
and uh, I'm just going to turn over the floor to stop him and ask questions, okay? I mean, we're here. This is a topic that more than being a textbook, as you've seen, it's, it's real life experience, day to day. What, what do we do? What, what do we look for? Where are we trying to mitigate risk? What are we trying to do? So experiences probably come a, a, a much longer way or go a much longer way than, you know, knowledge from a textbook. And he's got checklists. I've got checklists. I told you I'll leave you checklists. But more than following a checklist, it's, you know, it's learning from other people what may or may not have gone wrong in the past, okay? Okay. Um, so that you're aware of, that you are being taped. Good. Okay, so just, I, I said some things I shouldn't have said last week. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure I'll find uh, I, so I, I, uh, I don't really know what I'm going to say, so. Okay, so uh, I'm Ignacio. So, just as a caveat, never done this before, so please ask questions, correct me where you think I'm going wrong. If I'm going off on a tangent that you seem totally irrelevant, just get me back on track. Um, so, uh, George asked me to talk a little bit about, about diligence, and due diligence. Um, over my career, due diligence for me has kind of evolved. Um, when I started HFF, I was selling properties. And so when I did due diligence, I was more of a facilitator. So at HFF, we probably sold, you know, five to ten office buildings a year. And my role within the company was to kind of facilitate those sales. So I would put together an offering memorandum. And as I put together that offering memorandum, I kind of did my own diligence. Um, when I'm selling, um, I'm looking for assumptions, I'm putting together assumptions to come, come up with a value for the building, right? So I'm looking for things that I can defend. Right, so the way I break down diligence is really kind of four categories. Okay, is there a? Yeah, I'm sorry, and I just want to give you. I'll give you all the. I bring all my my personal stash of uh, different colors and just one color, I think. But you can. You can have all the colors. Like more gold. All right. So, so the way I see due diligence, I, I kind of break it down into four main main categories. There's the, what I'll call the, the economic due diligence, right? So this is the actual cash flow that the property is going to spit out, right? So it kind of starts with the leases and the operating expenses. You generate your revenues and your operating expenses, right? And then you get into further detail, right? You have your physical diligence, right? So what am I actually buying? Is it a 100,000 square foot office property? When was it built? How is it constructed? Uh, what do the mechanical systems look like? Uh, what are the age of the different things? And, and what you're focused on there is, how much money am I gonna have to spend on this property to maintain it so that I can continue to operate it as it's being represented or as I'm buying today, right? So if I'm buying an office building and it's got a roof that's 20 years old, I know that it's gonna start leaking at some point, right? So I have to come up with a number that accounts for the replacement or repair of that roof. And those are the kinds of things that you're focused on the physical diligence. Then there's what I, what I like to call the legal diligence. And this is probably the area where I'm least versed in, just because most of it is kind of third party through our attorneys. So these are things like zoning, compliance, title. Um, there are easement issues with certain properties, anything that really requires a lawyer to understand the document is what I'll throw into to legal. And um, a good attorney is worth his weight always, you know, certainly saved us a couple of times. And the last, uh, the last portion of diligence is market, right? And market varies from property to property, depending on the kind of property you're buying will be, um, will be the kind of diligence that you'll do. So when you're buying an office building, you've got to identify the competitive set. You know, you've got to identify where do my tenants come from, and that varies from building to building, whether it's the immediate area, whether it's a suburban building that's close to highways, so they come from different areas. And then what you want to really establish is what are my competitive properties charging, and how do I compare to those properties? Am I better? Am I worse? Can I charge more or less? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So maybe we could just go in to more detail on each category, and I'll kind of talk you through how I approach these things, right? 
And I'll talk you through how I approach them when I was selling buildings, and then I'll contrast that to how I approach them now that I'm buying buildings, because it's, it's really very, very different. And depending on what avenues you guys choose for a career, I think that you're going to look at due diligence a little bit differently, at least I found that I did. Okay. So, any questions so far on the, on the first now, I just want to pipe in on that, and I've told you guys in some of the other classes, people, everybody's always selling something. Dylan, you go to a bar, see a pretty girl, you're selling yourself, right? <laughs> CEOs on Squawk Box, you know, it doesn't matter if you have the worst quarter in the world, he's telling you why things are better. So notice to what Nachi just said, and we talked about this last week, a seller is always going to tell you all the great attributes of positive aspects of their property. It's your job as part of diligence, now wearing a buyer's hat to say, where can you crack those, okay? And it's not to say that people are lying. When we sold our business, we never lied. I responded to everybody's question. But if somebody didn't ask me, I didn't necessarily volunteer everything that I knew. It's life. Right, you, you buy buildings as is where it is, right? So that's that's kind of where it starts, right? It's a, it's a buyer beware. So you sign a contract, you get your 30, 45, 60 days to do your diligence on your property. That's really your opportunity to identify issues that may arise over, over your holding period, right? Um, that can hurt your investment. Okay, so, so again, Big difference between selling buildings and, and buying buildings. So when I was selling buildings, to, to put his point, um, I was looking to make assumptions and put them in kind of the offering materials that I could defend. It obviously put the property in the best light. We're hired by the seller to sell buildings, trying to get the highest value. So when I did my diligence, I was looking for positive things that I could sell to the market and justify to the market of buyers. Okay, so. On the, economic, on the economic side, it all starts with leases. Leases are the most important thing when you're buying a commercial property. If I can give you one piece of advice is to really understand how leases work, how they affect the value of a building, where you can get tripped up as a buyer, where you can add value as an owner. Leases are really the lifeblood. They're really what you're buying when you're buying a commercial building. Okay, so it starts with the leases. So both on the buy and the sell side, you read an abstract every lease. Okay, when you put an offering memorandum together, you read the lease and you put a little summary in the rent roll and you provide abstracts to the extent that um, buyers will ask for them. Then you audit the operating statements, right? Excuse my hand already. Um, so you audit the operating statements, right? So the leases will give you your revenue and the operating statements will give you a sense for your expenses. And then you'll come up with a, kind of a baseline net operating income, okay? Now, operating statements will give you a historical view of a building's op uh, performance, right? You have to know how that's going to change going forward because there are certain things that are affected by a purchase, for example. Real estate taxes will always be reassessed when you purchase the building, right? A, a rule of thumb that I use is probably 80 to 85% of the purchase price will be the assessed value uh, going forward for, for your real estate tax expense, okay? So that has an impact, and then so you need to understand the leases to understand how tenants reimburse any increases in operating expenses, whether you get to recover that increase or whether that's just gonna impact your net operating income. And, and I think this is a pitfall that I know that some brokers right now don't reassess real estate taxes. So if you're buying right now, you have to be very careful when you're looking at the cash flows presented to you by brokers because they're not reassessing for real estate taxes. And it can have a real impact depending on the property. Hey, and listen, just to harp on that, we talked about this a little bit last week. My personal experience is that brokers who underwrite buildings for sale never reassess property taxes. So it's always... I, I can tell you that I always did. Okay. But, so it's incumbent on you to, to realize that impact, number one. The other big one we talked about last week in South Florida in particular is insurance. And understand, depending on who you're buying from, there may be you know, either a positive or detrimental impact based upon who you are and how you're gonna manage and procure that. 
And a third point that Nachi mentioned is the most important thing is understanding the lead structure and figuring out whether those changes, you know, you're going to be able to recover or whether you're going to have to eat them and it's going to impact your underlying value, your cash flow. Right. Right. Um, right. So, so these are really the two main components of the economic diligence and then, so this is really all I focused on when I was selling buildings. Now that I'm buying buildings, the process becomes somewhat more involved, right? I still abstract at least, I still put together my own rent roll. Still look at the operating statements, and that kind of gives me a baseline for, for what it costs to run that property. But then I really audit that operating statement. I look at <coughs> past expenses. Is the, owner, is the owner passing through expenses that maybe won't translate to me going forward because it's a family-owned business and he puts cars through there? And, and phones through there and all that sort of thing, right? Or is he running it very thin? Does he own it all cash and not have an insurance policy at all or an insurance policy without wind, right? These are all things that you need to really audit. So it's really become a baseline for me to look at how the property has been performing and then I really have to understand what it's going to cost us to perform it as the new owner, right? So again, going back previous, I'm looking to justify kind of positive assumptions when I'm selling, right? So it's easy for me to justify operating expenses based on the old operating statements, right? I can tell the buyer here, look, this is what they were operating it at last year, and it's positive, it's very easy to justify. However, now, as a buyer, all about risk, all about where can I get tripped up? Uh, we have a saying at our firm, our investment philosophy is we can't lose money, it's all friends and family money, we can't lose money, so we are, all the discussions we have when we're looking at buying property is where's our risk and how can we mitigate that risk and if we can't mitigate it then we will you know we'll pass on the property you know right away so so I, a couple of things as a buyer what I do is we have kind of a wealth of experience because we own properties right now so we know more or less what it costs us to run the properties we own not more or less we know exactly what it costs us Process, right, so we can kind of extrapolate that data and apply it to a new property, um, and compare that to how it's being operated in the past. And and there have been instances where we know going in we're going to save money on operating expenses. The most recent building we purchased, we knew right away we were going to save about a dollar on operating expenses, which is huge, which we didn't have to give the seller credit for, obviously, because he doesn't know, you know, that, that we can operate it for cheaper. Conversely. There have been instances where, and, it, and this really happens with more kind of entrepreneurial local owners, they will, I'll say, edit their operating statements and make them look really, really good. And then when you look at it, they're operating an office building for $7 a square foot. And I know that I can't operate it for less than nine. So I don't know what he's doing, but it doesn't matter. I know that my number is nine. Um, so his numbers become almost irrelevant to me. Okay, so it's all about Previously, it was all about justifying assumptions on the sales side. On the buy side, all about mitigating risk. And, and that's really, that'll be a theme throughout all the different components of, of, of diligence. Nachi, let me ask you, maybe you can share some of your experience. You worked at HFF in a very high-end, you know, uh, pension fund, mm -hmm. re, you know, very transparent, yep. professional client base. You're now, it's just, I, I think I mentioned indirectly, you work in a very value plus value add type environment in which you're coming across ownership that is not necessarily institutional. You've had some right. and you haven't, but for instance, I think that the industrial portfolio of Medley was very family run and, well actually no it wasn't, but there was another family run and, you know, you know, on a market for a long time. What differences do you see between an institutional seller and the transparency of what they give you and, yeah. the, and the certainty and the, and the weariness maybe you need to have with the right. less? Yeah, so it, it really, that's a good point. So it really is, it's who's the owner and, and really who's the broker. Um, there are brokers that I trust and I look at their, their underwriting and I know that it's probably going to be pretty accurate. Um, and some of that has to do with the owners that they're selling for, and some of that has to do with um, the people that they're selling to, and they know they need to tailor their underwriting. It needs to be accurate because if if they're not credible, that's really all you have as a broker, in my opinion. 
you have your word, and, and if people can trust your assumptions, they can buy from you. And, and if they can't, they're just not going to buy from you. Right? So the biggest difference, I would say, between the, the local, more entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial owner and the institutional owner is it's not their money. So an institutional owner, you have a pension fund being managed by a team of people who aren't necessarily invested in the property. So it's really their job. And the building produces what it produces. Um, and it's very transparent and they'll give you that information because they're not necessarily vested. They're not, they don't need to make a million dollars on the sale of that building because it's their livelihood. They're gonna make their salary and mm -hmm. bonuses, whatever. Um, so they're not invested in it and it becomes a very professional environment. They're, they're professionals. They work for a company that owns real estate. <coughs> that real estate generates a certain amount of income, right? Um, the market does well, they operate the buildings well, the company does well, they probably do better, but they're not actually investing personally in the properties. What happens, in my opinion, with the local entrepreneurial owner is this is their livelihood in most cases. Um, and so they want to get every last dime from that property. So they will, sometimes within the realm of the law, sometimes not, uh, make the statements look as positive as possible so that they can get every last dime out of that sale. So you have to really, at least in my opinion, have a very, go through the, the statements with a fine tooth comb and figure out where they might be exaggerating, where they might be removing expenses, where they might be exaggerating, maybe not including delinquency rents, things like that, um, and, and really do your diligence. And what happens is a lot of those entrepreneurial owners will hire um, entrepreneurial brokers, mm -hmm. right? A one-man shop, right? And, and every, every sub-market kind of has their guy who's an expert in Medley, an expert in Kendall, an expert in Hialeah, an expert in North Miami Beach. They've all got, you know, every sub-market has their broker, right? And when those brokers, they'll go along with the owner and they say, oh, give me your NOI from last year. And it does, he's not going to screw up the numbers. He's going to take it. He's going to put it. He's going to present it to the market. Versus an institutional broker shop like a C.B. Richard Ellis, a Jones Lang, LaSalle, and HFL. They know that their buyers are professionals and they know that they know how to underwrite buildings. So they, a lot of times, will push back on those entrepreneurial owners and say, no, 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 no. You may be operating for $7 a square foot, but I know the market is eight fifty, So I have to underwrite it at eight fifty because that's what the market's going to underwrite it. So those, those entrepreneurial sellers a lot of times don't like to work with the institutional brokers. And, and I think it's, it's a mistake, because at the end of the day, unless you get some idiot who just wants to put money into a building, it all comes out. It, it always comes out. I mean, math is very simple, and people who are in this, it's, a, it's not a hard business. You don't have to be super smart to do it, but you have to have experience to do it, I think. And people who have experience know how to operate buildings, and they're going to be able to tear apart a doctor or, or I want to say doctor, but a optimistic operating statement pretty easily, I think. And I think that's what happens and why entrepreneurial owners, when they sell buildings, it usually takes about a year versus an institutional owner will sell a building in three to six months because the assumptions that go into that sale are much more credible and there's not that extra layer of diligence and scrutiny that needs to be applied to their property. Okay? Um, so the, Economic. Any other questions on economic diligence? I don't know if I skipped over anything. No, I, look, the only thing, and then I'll, I'm borrowing from some of the other classes, some of the other concepts that we talk about. When Nancy talks about leases and the importance of leases, uh, there's a diligence component, which, and, and we'll work later today, we're going to do a lease abstract. I'm sort of jumping the gun. We're actually, Glenn's been kind enough to share with us. The, the information from an asset that they recently acquired, and you're actually going to abstract leases yourself. I'm going to walk through one and abstract one with you, and you're actually going to have an opportunity to do it. But it's important because there are situations and conditions in the lease realm that definitely impact your cash flow. So I've come across situations where there have been hidden payments that weren't disclosed. Not necessarily because someone was trying to obscure them from us, they just 
didn't even know themselves. You know, there was a lease amendment somewhere, and people took extra space, and there was a half million dollar payment that was coming up that was due. You know, that's real money, right? But the important thing is, you know, we've talked in this class about how real estate is a financial asset. A financial asset is worth the net present value. It's means your cash flows, and that's the cash flow source. That's the generator. Yeah. That's the revenue from which everything else is deducted. And if, for example, who read the newspaper this morning? It has nothing to do with real estate. Who read the newspaper? Joe Madden. You guys know who that guy is? He's a manager of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays or whatever. What did he do last night? Well, he opted out of a contract, right? And what's the biggest problem that we have with the lease, or potential problem that we have with revenue? Somebody's got an early termination clause. And what impact does that have on your income stream? And there will always be people that have, maybe for a fee, they will have the option to opt out of a lease, or give back space in a lease, or, you know, other things that may trip you up. People may have rights of first offer, rights of first, you know, refusal on particular space or contiguous space. So there's a series of operational and financial components that are impacting the leases that make it, you know, potentially the most important thing that you could do in the diligence process is to understand, understand who your tenant base is and what contractual obligation you have with them and a contractual obligation that governs your relationship with them. Okay? More so than any other business, as I mentioned before, how I used to do you know, I, I did diligence work on a more middle market company, not real estate. Real estate has the unique you know, aspect that the contracts, you know, follow the asset, as opposed to you're selling a company and people don't tend to have contracts as much as they have relationships with marketing teams. Here you have contracts, and those contracts, those leases clearly lay out what that income stream is and what possible impact there may be positive or negative associated with it. So I can't impress upon you enough the importance, as Naki said, of understanding who the tenants are and understanding what rights and obligations they have and what rights and obligations you have in relation to that. Right. I mean, I can go into more detail on what's important to look for in a lease if, if you think that that well, might Naki, be. I, I would say, you know, preempting what we're going to do later today, if you could highlight a couple yeah. of things that you would, I, I would. Yeah, yeah okay, so, so leases. And, and something that, that you touched on that I think I missed leases and really um, tenant roster. Who are your tenants and how credit worthy are they? Right? Is their business worth anything? Is it a dying business? For example, buying a shopping center and there's a bookstore, probably not your best tenant. Right? Uh, Amazon's kind of won that business. Um, so those are the, so that so there are two components when it comes to tenancy. So leases. Okay. Leases in South Florida, and I'll just keep it to South Florida because that's what I know best, have kind of three broad structures. And it's really as it relates to how operating expenses are treated as a component of or in addition to their base rent. Right, so you have your what I'll call triple net leases. Okay? So triple net leases are where base rent and operating expenses are treated independently of each other. Your base rent is your base rent, and you're going to pay that with certain increases over the term of that lease, right? And then you're going to reimburse the landlord for your ratable share of operating expenses. And ratable share is, is your ratable share of the building, the space you occupy divided by the size of the building you give your pro rata share, okay? So whether expenses go up or down, your reimbursement of those expenses may go up or down. Okay? Well, um, yeah. When you say reimburse, are you speaking of, uh, let's say, if the AC goes out in that office space? You know, that's a, that's a tricky question. AC goes out. Um, so let's, let's go through the expenses that are typically reimbursed. And so that's kind of a tricky one. Okay. Um, so what, what's typically reimbursed? So it's, it's ongoing costs to operate the building that aren't quote unquote extraordinary, okay? Um, so that's real estate taxes, insurance, utilities, electricity, water, uh, management, up to the level of property manager. Typically leases will not allow you to pass through salaries or benefits to asset managers, right? Just, pro just what's at the property level. 
um, trash removal, cleaning, um, some level of repairs and maintenance. So that's kind of where an AC going down is a little bit tricky. If it's just as simple as you need to clean the air filter and it froze up, yeah, you can pass that through. But if it's, man, my chiller broke and it's $500,000 to repair it, can't pass that through. It all depends on how the leases are written, but the likelihood is that you can't pass that through. It's, it's what typical operating expenses to keep the building running. You know, a replacement of a chiller would be kind of a capital expense, okay. right? So that's something that, that the landlord will spend the money. Sometimes if you have a capital expense, for example, a new air conditioning system or a new roof cover that becomes more efficient and will actually save you money, you can uh, depreciate and amortize the cost of that over the life of the item you're replacing and pass that through to the tenants if it saves you money. Um, but th these are nuances that, that you'll, you'll really figure out, you know, kind of as you read more. So would that be like the uh, same example as a, a, roof, a roof leak versus a roof replacement? Sure. So a roof leak would be? Yeah, so a roof leak might cost you 500 bucks, right? So you can probably put that through, but if you have to remove the membrane and put a whole new roof system, Again, it's, it's probably capital. not going to be able to yeah, capital item. From a, a sell side, if, if you had a property, it was like an aging property, and you had a ton of roof leaks and HVAC issues, but you were looking to sell the property, mm -hmm. do, you, do you look at it differently? Do you say, well, I should do capital improvements here because my NOI will look better to invest Yeah, in? so, so that's kind of a cost-benefit analysis that every owner has to go through. Um, I can tell you that so repairs and maintenance is kind of whatever happens over the course of the year in terms of things that break down. Um, so a lot of times that's something that'll get smoothed out in a sale. But in an older building, um, a seller will say, okay, how much is it costing me every year in repair and maintenance, right? Is it costing me a little bit of money or is it costing me a lot of money? And then how much does it cost to replace that item that's constantly breaking down, okay? So if I do it, I know my operating expenses are gonna decrease by a certain amount and I'm gonna capitalize that higher income, right, and get a value. So that, is that increase in value more than the cost to replace that item? That's one, that's one thing to factor in. The other thing to factor in is a lot of buyers just don't wanna deal with broken roofs or broken air conditioning systems, right? So in my opinion, it's always better either to disclose it to the buyer that, hey, these things are old, you're gonna to have to replace them, or replace them yourself because it broadens your market of buyers. But you know, it, it, these things can cost a lot of money and a lot of sellers don't have the money to do it. So it, you know, it all varies from, from person to person. So you give them a credit? I mean, that's another Sometimes you can give them a credit. So, so I guess that's a good point. And, and that's kind of when you wrap up diligence, right? You put a property under contract, you go in with kind of a set of assumptions and then you do your, all of your diligence and that's going to either confirm or raise issues on those assumptions that you made. And so once your due diligence period is expiring, if you've identified something, for example, we were looking at a portfolio in Orlando recently, of uh, single story, call them industrial buildings. Um, the seller represented to us that all the, the roofs were under warranty for the next 10 years. And when we did our diligence, we took our roofer up there and he called us and he said, hey man, I know this roof is new, but it looks really bad. So I would call the uh, manufacturer that's providing the warranty and make sure that they're going to actually transfer that warranty because it looks really bad. So we did that and the manufacturer said, absolutely not, you're not transferring the warranty. So I told the seller, I said, hey man, we thought this was under warranty, now I have to factor in you know, $700,000 of roof replacement, I need an adjustment on the price because it didn't go into my initial assumptions. And so yeah, so that, but that's kind of when you wrap up, you know, and there's different, Factors that'll you know with under each category can affect a credit at closing, and sometimes the seller will give you that credit, or sometimes they say, you know what, I don't want to sell that anymore, and, and then it falls out of contract. And, and, and guys, I just want to harp on on a comment I made last week on that, which is when you're in the real estate business, one of the costs that you have, one of the some costs that you have is is a cost to carry out diligence. Here's a situation where you run after a building, you get it under contract. Yeah. 
and you spend real money. Oh, you spend 50,000 bucks. For you sure. spend real money and real time abstracting leases, taking trips, and a deal falls apart. Right. And it's gone. And it's, so it's, it's a cost of doing business mm -hmm. that nobody likes. But if you want to chase properties, you want know, to chase money to make money. Mm -hmm. You have to assume. And not just as 50, you know, my experience has been depending on the asset, you can spend between 50 to as much as a couple hundred thousand bucks to push it on on the size of the asset or the portfolio that you're looking at. And again, going back to the comment we made before, the more transparent, the more professional, the more institutional in nature, the less likely you're going to get a surprise in the end. Right. The more entrepreneurial, which can be good or bad, the more entrepreneurial, the more homemade, the more home-cooked, <laughs> you know, you know, you're, it's, it's a crapshoot. It's a crapshoot, you know, so. Okay, so going back to Lisa, so just a quick question. Sure. Uh, is that considered a capital loss at that point? Uh, Which it, I mean, it's an operating. You're saying from a tax perspective, it's yeah, a yeah. business. It's an operating cost of your business, and so. Yeah, pursuit costs. Yeah, no pursuit costs, but then, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a cost of your business, and you, it's an expense. It's like salaries, you know. It's it's an expense, and you deduct it, and you move forward. But 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 you've lost the cash. That's I mean, you know, forget what the P and L says. Yeah, it's like gone. cash <laughs> has <laughs> money talks, right? Yeah. Cash screams, and the cash screams out the door. It's gone, yeah, and you don't have an asset now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just gone. So, so going back to leases, so the triple net structure. Any any other questions on the triple net structure? Okay, then there's what I what I'll call the the full service structure. Full service is. You pay your base rent, and factored into that base rent is your operating expenses. So whether your expenses go, whether the property expenses go up or down, is not necessarily relevant to what you're going to be paying the landlord every month, because it's contemplated, and whether properties go up or down, it doesn't matter in terms of operating expenses. You're going to pay them your ten, fifteen, twenty dollars square foot, whatever it says in the lease. Okay, and then there's what's called kind of modified gross expenses, and this is the most common kind of south of Broward County. And then as you get north of Broward County, it kind of starts con uh, converting to triple net. And Palm Beach County is almost exclusively triple net for whatever reason. But you need to understand the market you work in, guys. You need right. to understand that. Right, so modified gross is really a blend, a blend of these two, okay? So I I'll just do it with a quick math example with, with, with numbers on the board. So. If your base rent under a modified gross lease is $20 a square foot, defined in that $20 a square foot is going to be your first year's operating expense. So let's just, for, for argument's sake, say that that's $10 a square foot. So 50% of your base rent, or $10, is operating expenses. The other $10 is base rent. Okay. If it's a three-year term with 3% annual increases, right, your next year's rent is going to be $20.60, right? In addition to that, if your operating expenses increase by 3%, you're going to pay your ratable share on that $0.30. Cents. So if you operate 100% of the build, let's say you occupy 100% of the building, you're gonna pay another 30 cents, and so you're really gonna be paying the landlord $20.90 in the second year because you have to reimburse him for that increase in operating expenses. However, in most cases, if operating expenses go down, you do not get a credit as a tenant uh, for a reduction in operating expenses. You'll just only pay the landlord your 3% increase. Okay, so that's, those are kind of the three main Operating expense structures. Yeah. Do the tenants ask the landlord to see, <coughs> like, you say, hey, it went up three percent. Are they asking to see? Well, I want to see where it went up three percent. Sure. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to do that, and that's also defined in the lease. They have the ability to audit the landlord's operating. But that's expense. pretty common that they do, or is it just kind of? No, I wouldn't say it's common. Um, if it only goes up three percent, I would say it almost never happens. I think people generally assume inflation is 3% and they'll accept the 3% increase. Uh, if it goes up by a large amount, it'll happen all the time. 
and there are certain tenants, specifically national tenants, they have an operation, and they will, um, they'll almost always audit. For example, we just purchased a shopping center that has TJ Maxx in it, and the seller already told us they're going to audit you, and it's going to be a bear. They're going to, you have to keep every receipt for everything you spend because they're going to audit you as just a course of business. So whether expenses go up or down, we're going to get audited by the tenant. Um, so it really varies from tenant to tenant, but the way they can audit you is also defined in the lease, and kind of it also has dispute settlements and and, and all that sort of thing. So the leases are, are, are super 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 critical. I can't I can't emphasize it enough. Yeah. Dustin, my experience has been that most leases give some level of ability to review. You obviously try to structure your form lease in a way and not negotiate away from a structure where people don't necessarily have that much, you know, in the way of rights. I haven't seen this in a long time, but I remember back in the 80s actually doing for a property owner an audit or a special, it was actually, you know, what we called uh, an agreed upon procedures report. It was a large office building in Chicago, and we just did a report on operating expenses so that they would just have it handy and available, and available to give to their uh, to the tenants, and it's kind of avoided the questions that way. You say, "Hey, Price Waterhouse has this for that work." So, if you got any questions, you know, look at it. And again, I think my experience has been to the extent that expenses don't go up significantly, nobody can watch you. You know, all of a sudden, insurance rates go up. You know, <coughs> and we saw it in 2005 yeah. years. I'm after the little line Katrina, mm. rates went up. You know. Premiums went off, okay. expenses went off, people pass those to the tenants, okay. and, you know, tenants to be out of expenses, but it's like, whoa, you know, you know, we didn't budget this. So, but again, look, it's important. We, we touched, touched on it slightly in the accounting class. We talked about the different structures, but it's important to understand, ultimately, who's at risk. If you look at the high structure, the risk of operating expense increases is purely on the tenant side. Right? And if you look at the full service, the cost, you know, the risk of increases in expenses is totally on the landlord side. The modified growth tries to balance, you know, the playing field a little bit, okay? And certain markets, Broward County is much more, and again, Palm Beach, much more triple net markets. That's just what business practices and customs are. Bay County is much more of a full service or industrial gross or whatever you want to call market. Yeah, one. On the, on the triple net, the, the the tenant is the one reimbursing all the expenses? That's correct. Okay. And, and it, you know, typically it's a reimbursed structure. I mean, you, you get into situations at times where certain expenses are directly metered. You know, I, I've seen, like I'll say you've got a call center with like large electrical expenses or whatever. People have their own backup generation or whatever. The landlord doesn't even pay and then get reimbursement. The tenant pays directly. So our okay. rent's usually lower on, on triple net? Well, it, it just, Mathematically, if you look at the example, right, a gross rent. Yeah, so if you want, I'll, I'll put examples of, of each type so you can see how, from a tenant's perspective, it'll look. Yeah. And, and if, if you get that, when you get to the accounting class, you'll get one of the answers in one of the quizzes right. You know, a gross <laughs> rent's usually higher or lower than that rent. So, you know, right there. Right there, right there. So, like, <laughs> ask. Like, like, publics would pay their own power bill in their space, but they're going to pay a prorated portion of like the parking lot lights. That's right. And, uh, That's right. right. But they're going to pay. No. They they'll, have they'll, 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 they'll have a deal with FPL directly right. and open up their own account. And, and then are and those, so it won't hit the landlord at all. Are those um, those expenses that are they reimbursed typically monthly or quarterly? So what happens is is the way it typically works is the landlord will, will come up with a budget for the year, right? And he will bill the tenants according to that budget. And then at the end of the year, there's what's called a reconciliation. Okay. Right, and so if and every landlord kind of does it a little bit different. Sometimes they like to be reimbursed more than they anticipate, and they give their tenants back money. Sometimes, if they have good tenants, they'll charge the tenants less to keep them happier. And they'll hit them with a bill at the end of the year, and it really just varies. And you know, from that perspective, we what we did at Flagler, the last place that I worked, we would quarterly update mm -hmm. to actual, and we would Can either start? adjust. You know, going forward, uh, or leave things the way they were. If we were hitting our budgets, we wouldn't touch anything. If expenses looked like they were running up or down, we would adjust. You know, the invoices going forward, so that nobody got. That was our. We didn't want the big surprise at the end, 
and we didn't want it internally. You know, one of the other things is if, if there is a big refund to give from the property owner's perspective, right, you want to make sure you're accruing for that so that you're not recognizing income and then taking a big hit the next year. Right. So it's not just the tenant side, right. you as a property owner don't want to get hit at the end. So. That's right. That's right. And then um, one more question, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then same with the, the, the like parking lot and the drainage in the parking lot, is that all also typically? Uh, yeah, whatever the extent. Yeah, it's prorated um, over the tenants in the building. Okay, so it's typically, again, look, and this is why it's important to read an abstract or release. The typical situation would be where any expense is reimbursed by each tenant's pro rata share. However, and, and I can give you a quick example of, of how sometimes it's different, um, there are cases where it is different. Uh, for example, in a lot of shopping centers, um, the anchor tenant will reimburse its share of operating expenses after the, I think that's right. Is that right, Glenn? I think that's right. right? Yeah. After the inline tenants, because the inline tenants will typically pay a higher expense. If that makes any sense, it doesn't make sense. Um, they'll pay a higher per square foot expense because um, the landlord can typically charge like a 15% admin fee on inline tenants and things like that. So the operating expenses will be reduced by what the inline tenants pay, and then the anchor tenant will pay its radical share, which is typically a reduced per square foot number. Mm. I think that's right. Yeah. I haven't worked on one of those in a while, but I think that's right. Uh, before I forget, it has nothing to do with this, but just a, a topic. Do you typically require estoppels from all of your tenants? Sure. So, so is it 100% or do you uh, Well, it, it varies. It I feel, I feel, I feel right? it's 100%, right? So this is a part of the legal portion of um, of the diligence. Um, so estoppels, what estoppels are, estoppels are a, a document provided to you by the tenant that confirms the terms of their lease, right? So I am XYZ tenant, I occupy suite A, I occupy a thousand square feet, I'm currently paying you a thousand dollars a month in rent, uh, my lease doesn't expire till January of 2016, whenever it expires. Uh, I have no termination options, I have no renewal options, or I have renewal options, whatever the lease says. And I have no right to buy the building, which is actually a really important thing as you're getting title insurance. Um, in a perfect world, you get that from 100% of the tenants. Um, that's something that you negotiate in any contract with any seller. Typically, the seller will say, I'll give you 85% of the occupied square footage, and then I'll give you an estoppel a seller's estoppel for the balance. Um, so that, that works out sometimes. Other times, the lender will require you to get a certain percentage of estoppels. So you gotta get that. So it's really important when you're negotiating contracts, sale and financing do and loan documents, that those two numbers on estoppels marry each other. Um, so I always ask the seller for a huge number because I know that banks typically require 75 to 80 percent of the stop so I'll typically try to get 85 to 90 percent of the stop from the seller so I know that I'm covered. And, and the reason I just say that, going back to let's keep triangulating on all the concepts here, ultimately it's to mitigate risk. Right. There's an income stream that we're trying to get our hands on. We want to understand it, but we also want the certainty from the tenants that the documents we're looking at are in fact the right documents. Right, right because sometimes what happened, going back to something you said earlier, and, and this is how we've uncovered it in the past is, the landlord will have sent an email to the tenant that says, I'm gonna give you a TI on your renewal of $20 a square foot. And it's not anywhere in the lease document. And the tenant will write it in the estoppel. I know that I have a $20 a square foot TI allowance coming on my renewal. And there's no way that I would have seen that unless the tenant wrote it in the estoppel. What's TI? A tenant improvement allowance. Oh, okay. So um, as far as relationship between uh, the, the the lease estoppel, and then you actually, as a, as a buyer, getting the leases and going through all of them, like what is the difference there? Well, so, the, so it's twofold. Typically, as the buyer, you will do your own abstract immediately once due diligence starts. For a host of reasons, you won't get your estoppels until the end, right before you purchase a building, really. In most cases, the last two to three weeks is when most of the estoppels start coming in. And the, 
The biggest reason for that is most sellers don't want to tell their tenants that the building's for sale until they know for sure they have a deal. Um, the biggest difference between the abstract and the estoppel is I'm doing the abstract as a buyer. The estoppel is coming to me from the tenant. Right, so the last step of due diligence, at least for me, typically has been going through my lease abstracts and comparing them to my estoppels. And are my abstracts right, or are the estoppels right? And if there's a discrepancy, who's wrong, and how do we, how do we solve it? And, and I, I think, as I said last week, typically the estoppel is, is one of the few ways that you ultimately can impact the purchase price. Because yeah. at that point, the seller is pretty much obliged to sell. And you've got a legitimate claim against the cash flow that they've Yeah, and there's in. language in the contract, so it gets kind of tricky because typically you're hard, quote unquote, right? So your due diligence is expired and um, your money's non refundable, right? So you've got to close, and there's, in any contract, there's a host of reasons why you can't close. And one of the things that we always try to put into our contracts is if the estoppels, either you don't get the percentage or they don't marry what was provided to us on the rent roll in a material way, and material is always tricky to negotiate, um, you can get your money back and walk away from the deal, or the seller has to resolve it. I have two questions. So the first is with the $20 um, TI improvements, if it's in an email with the current owner, it's legally binding for... You know, it's tricky. Sure. It's tricky. Um, I don't know that it's legally binding or not. If the tenant <coughs> expects it, you as an owner are going to have to deal with it one way or another, right? As an owner, you want to keep your tenants happy. If the tenant's under the impression he's going to get $20 a square foot, and I come in as a buyer and say, screw you, I'm not paying you anything because your lease doesn't call for it, he's going to leave, yeah. right, which, and, is, which is bad. And, and remember, I, I mean, undergraduate contract law, you know, a, a contract doesn't have to be in writing even, right. you know? So a pre representation with an exchange of, you know, Offer and you know, right, hey, but where it becomes tricky is because it wasn't disclosed to the buyer, right? So, I think that there is a gray area there. But I think if the owner doesn't sell, I think it's legally binding for sure. Yeah, um, if, it, if you sell, I think there's a, a gray area, but it's an issue, and you don't want to, you don't want issues like that when, when you're buying. You know, you want to know what your exposure is going for. Yeah. And then the other question is, what are the issues? Like, why wouldn't you be able to get 100% of the estoppels? What kinds of things? A lot of times tenants don't just want to give them. Yeah. Uh, for example, tenants, think about it. Tenants, my mom is a tenant. My mom owns a business. She owns a preschool in a warehouse. My mom doesn't know the first thing about what her lease says. She doesn't know the first thing about anything that the, 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 the just looking at the legal document scares the shit out of her. Mm -hmm. Right? So she'll get the estoppel and say, what the hell is this? Am I in trouble? No, I'm not signing that. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, so you have tenants like that, and they just don't want to give them. And sometimes the tenant is pissed off at the owner because he took away reserved spaces, and just to piss him off, he won't, you know, he won't sign it. Now, you can kick the tenant out because in his lease, it typically says he has to give you an estoppel you know, within 10 days of receiving it. But, but I can tell you as a seller, that's the biggest pain of a selling process is chasing down. And then you get the national tenants that well, local people that you deal with don't want to sign anything. Oh yeah. So you got to try to chase somebody in a real estate office somewhere in, you know, Peoria, Illinois. So look, a perfect example of this is, we again, property we just purchased, a shopping center, had Joanne Fabrics in it. Uh, Joanne Fabric had been trying to renew their lease with the owner for the last, their lease was expiring right as the sale was coming. Um, and they had been trying to renew their lease and they had been approaching the owner for a long time and part of the contract negotiation with the seller was, we're not going to deliver you Joanne Fabric because we think they're really mad at us. I mean, that was literally the conversation on the phone. And we don't think that they'll deal with us. We got the estoppel because Joanne Fabric's a national company and it's kind of a process. And you go through the process, they give you an estoppel. But the seller was scared that Joanne Fabric was mad at them and that they couldn't deliver an estoppel. So issues like that come up. Um, when you're buying buildings and they can be, look, if we wouldn't have gotten that estoppel, I think we still would have been able to close, but the financing would have been a little tricky. Um, so it, they can become real issues. Okay, so do you guys want me to, um, the same way I did with the modified gross example, kind of show you how these different structures look with numbers? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, a trip, so, so just using the same expenses, so it's apples to apples. Um, a triple net structure, the tenant's base, so this is the base rent, right? Right, so the tenant's base rent would be $10 in year one. The tenant's 
operating expenses would be $10 because that's what the property actually costs the owner to operate, $10 a square foot in operating expenses. In year two, with 3% increases, his base rent is $10.30. The, the, the operating expenses go up by the same 3%, right? So in year two, he's reimbursing you $10.30, paying you a total of $20.60 in year two versus $20.90 in year one, in, in a modified gross example. Do you guys understand why the difference? This is the triple net, right? The bottom is the triple net, right? And this is modified. Do you guys understand why there's a difference in in um, in the two numbers, in the twenty sixty versus the twenty ninety? So you're gonna have to reimburse three percent on twenty. Three percent on twenty. That's right. The twenty is growing at three percent. Twenty is a bigger number than ten. So your base rent is growing by by three percent. But because the num your base rent is a larger number, that three percent is over a, a larger thing, and you're getting your three percent on the expense. So that's why. And so on, under a full service, it's very simple. Uh, your, your operating expenses, again, are $20. It's irrelevant. I'm sorry, your base rent is $20. It's irrelevant what your operating expenses are. Your, your rent goes up by 3%. You're paying 26 And that's what it is. And it doesn't really matter uh, what your expense are. And, and I think you could argue, well, you know, if I'm a landlord or a tenant, what would I prefer? The reality is, is the market, for the most part, is going to dictate yeah. what you want. Okay, and again, it's just understanding. You, know, you may operate in different markets. You just need to understand who you are and you try to mitigate your risk, or at least understand what your exposure is, right? And again, just as I said, triple net environment. The risk of operating expenses or the benefit is always with the tenant, and in full service, it's always with the landlord. Yep. Yeah. But the market will dictate that. Right. So on leases, that's kind of the. the, the, the three main structures of, of leases when it comes to base rent and operating expenses. The other important terms in a lease that you want to review, can I erase it? Mm -hmm. um, the other, there's obviously other terms in a lease that you want to review. And, and I'll touch on those and if I forget any, let me know. Um, obviously the size of the, of the space. Um, you know, so you have you have who the tenant is. Uh, this symbol for me means tenant. So if I write that, that's okay. that's tenant. It's pie. Yeah, pie. <laughs> um, the size, right? So the size of the space that they occupy. Um, and I'll just touch on this for a second. This can be a little bit tricky, and I don't want to get into too much minutia here. But the size can actually change. Uh, of the size of a tenant suite can actually change. And this goes into how a building size is measured. Have you remeasured any buildings, not you? We have. And who have you used? Do you use a survey or who do you use? An architect. That? An architect. Yeah. Yeah. So there's kind of an industry stint, and, and, it's, and it's a little bit complicated. So I don't know if it's worth no, getting look, into. Look, I just touched, I just said, you hear, I, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago, which we talked about, I think, in the Capital Markets class. The old Pan Am building in New York, mm -hmm. which is now the Met Life building. Right. It's two million square feet bigger yeah. than it was in the 70s based yeah. on the I can tell you why, for sure. Um, so, so I'll get into it a little bit. Um, size is obviously how big a space is and how big a building is. But the way you measure the size of a building is almost open to interpretation a little bit. And it's also what the market will dictate. And I'll tell you why. Um, there's something that's called a BOMA calculation. I forget what BOMA stands for. Building but it's, owners and managers associated. Right, right, right. Um, but it's kind of the quote unquote industry standard of building measurements. And in broad strokes, you get your footprint of the building, you remove the vertical penetrations, right? So your elevator shafts and your stairwells, and in some instances, your air handler rooms if they penetrate every floor. Um, you remove those, you add up each floor, that's your rentable square footage, right? You take the space actually occupied by tenants, that's your usable square footage, and then that ratio becomes your common area factor, your BOMA factor, okay? So depending on when a building was measured, those rules have changed, okay? So 
And depending on the sophistication of the owner, they may or may not know what the rules are. So one of the first buildings we bought, um, local Miami owner, kind of not sophisticated at all. He was only charging tenants for the space they were actually occupying, right? So this room, let's, let's say for, for, for instance, is 20 feet by 40 feet, right? So that's uh, 800, 8,000, 800 square feet. Um, that's just this room. This floor, however, let's say is 10,000 square feet. And of that, 2,000 square feet are hallways and bathrooms. I have to, under BOMA, you can charge this tenant for their portion of those floors and hallways. Okay, so while this room may only be 800 square feet, when I include the size of my ratable size of the hallways and bathrooms, I may actually be charged uh, 1,000 square feet, depending on how efficient or inefficient the design of the building is. Um, and so when I say the size of the square footage can change, a lot of times the leases will say the building can be remeasured from time to time. And as you buy a building, you may choose to remeasure it, and then the size of, of the building may change. And if it doesn't say that, then you... If it doesn't say that, you have to wait for the lease to expire and then charge it on, on the new tenant. And just, just stop to think, I mean, even without any errors, an original owner may charge his rents based on what was designed. Right. And as built, may be slightly different, you know? There were conditions that changed and maybe, you, you know, stop to think on a 30-story building if you have an extra three feet, you know? Yeah, that becomes a lot. Yeah. And, and the other thing is you may lose a lot. If buildings are designed very inefficiently, there's kind of a market common area factor that tenants are willing to accept and it varies from market to market. For, for high-rise office buildings, that factor is typically higher, 20% or so. Uh, for a suburban building, typically less, closer to 15%. So an architect may have a beautiful design with a three-story lobby and huge flowing hallways, but it becomes super inefficient and you can't charge for it because the tenants won't accept it. Um, so, so it's something to look into in the lease. Um, term. So term seems super straightforward, right? Yeah. My lease starts one day and it ends another day. Yeah. I just had a quick question. When you, when you negotiate and you go through these kinds of negotiations, for example, something like this that takes up a lot of space running the, this, this little ledge. Oh, this ledge, yeah. That takes up a lot of space running the entire length of the building. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there are tenants who will nitpick at stuff like that? You have to... I find that the tenants do not, unless they're out. national tenants will not nitpick at this stuff as long as you're not being a pig about it because in order to do a proper BOMA calculation you have to measure the whole building and that costs about 15 cents a square foot <coughs> so on a hundred thousand square foot building that's fifteen thousand dollars and most tenants aren't going to spec fifteen thousand dollars so they'll either say I don't agree with it and <coughs> not really have any backup for it, or, and then they'll move on to another building, or they'll just accept it. So if I were to measure, I would, for this, if I wanted to include that, I could go from the window to the wall straight across. At That's the how it's measured. It's, it's, the, uh, it, it's defined in the BOMA regulations, but yeah, typically it's uh, the inside of the window to the inside of the wall for the usable area, and then the inside of the perimeter facade to the inside of the corresponding perimeter side on, on the other side to get the rentable area without the vertical penetration. Okay. Thank you. All right, so term. Uh, term is basic, right? When a tenant starts or when, they, when their lease expires. This is where options kind of first come into place. Tenants have options to renew their lease, right? So a tenant's initial term is three years. They may have a one, three to five year option to renew. Now that option may be at a fixed rent. It may be at a market rent, and market is defined. Um, and then there are also termination options. This is where a tenant has the right to end his lease prior to their initial term. Um, termination options actually come for a host of different reasons. I've seen termination options because it's a sole practitioner attorney and he's 80 years old and 
they negotiate, if he dies, the lease terminates. Right? The estate doesn't need to continue paying the lease. Um, sometimes larger tenants will sign the 10-year lease and they'll have an option to terminate after five years. And m in most cases with larger tenants, there's a penalty a ter called a termination penalty associated with a tenant's exer exercise of their termination option. Typically, it's the unamortized portions of their TIs and leasing commissions plus some nominal fee, maybe two or three months base rent. So they have to pay you that amount when they exercise their termination option. Can you repeat that? Yeah. yeah. So uh, larger tenants typically will negotiate a termination option, or they'll try to negotiate a termination option into their lease. So, um, so when that happens, they, they have the right to end their lease prior to the initial term of their lease, right? So the language will read, you know, tenant has the right um, with 120 days notice to the landlord to exercise a termination option with a termination fee of the unamortized, typically the unamortized portion of their TI and lease commission <coughs> accounts when they sign the lease, plus some nominal amount that's typically defined in the lease, uh, and it usually amounts to two or three months base rent. Um, obviously, as a landlord, you want to get as much in terms of termination fee as possible. Uh, and as a tenant, you're gonna want that as low as possible, so it's you know, just a negotiation. Do you, see, do you see a lot of termination options in leases? Yeah, yeah, you do, you do. Particularly on longer term leases and on larger leases. And Juan, you just need to understand that because it goes, it goes back to it. It's gonna impact your cash flow. Now, I, I think in diligence, we typically are more concerned with downside risk, right? You know, one of the things that Nachi looks at more as a buyer and I think Glenn looks at it more as a buyer, is, is yeah, you're trying to mitigate risk, but a tenant blowing out early is also a potential opportunity, depending on the difference between what right. the market is right. and what the in-place rent is. So, again, that leasing spread, where's the market? You know, is it in rising markets, mm -hmm. tenants blowing out are not necessarily bad things. Right. If rents are increasing at higher than okay. what are typically CPI increases in rents. In down markets, that's not a good thing because usually those rents in place are higher than right. what you're going to be able to replace it at. Right, and it's going to take longer to replace. And it's going to take longer because the market's not favorable. Right. Okay, so size, term, um, and then there's a host of clauses in every lease, and it kind of varies from property to property that, that you should be wary of. Parking, um, parking is a big one, in my opinion, that I think sometimes gets overlooked what the tenant's rights are to parking spaces can, can really affect the operations of a property. I've seen buildings where a tenant gets an above ratio <coughs> parking allotment and it impacts the value of the building because then you don't have parking spaces for the rest of your tenants. Um, so you gotta understand parking rights, you gotta understand, um, so to understand um, right to purchase, um, you typically see that with really large tenants. Um, sometimes the landlord will give them a right to purchase. And then there's other rights. There are rights to expand and rights to contract and rights of, of first option, rights of first offer, or rights of first, not option, rights of first offer, and rights of first refusal for other space in the building. It's really important to understand those rights that the tenant has because as you're putting together a leasing plan, you need to know how marketable each of your vacant spaces or potentially vacant spaces. The option to purchase, when is that an option? Can you like show it an example? Sure. Because it's not just that they can just buy it whenever they want, I assume. Uh, sometime, it depends how it's written. Okay. Um, sometimes they can buy, and so it, it's critical, and correct me up here because sometimes I get confused. There's an op option to purchase. Purchase options are, are structured two ways. Okay, there's the right of first offer and the right of first refusal. Okay, and, 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 it's, and it's, in my opinion, it's very important whether it's offer or refusal because it can really tie up the owner of the building for a long time, depending on how the language is written. And I'll give you one example. I was selling a building in Brickle Avenue, 999 Brickle, if you're familiar with it, it's where the Helm Bank building is. Um, Helm Bank had an option to purchase the building. It was a right of first refusal. 
Okay, so what that means is when the owner, and correct me if I'm wrong here, when the owner goes out to sell the property, the market comes back and offers come in, right? And then so he has to put it to the tenant where the offers come in, and if the tenant is within 10% of where those, uh, where, where the owner puts it to the tenant, he has the right to buy it. So he has the right to refuse a purchase option, okay? Conversely, a right of first offer, which is what I would want, I think, if I was an owner, is I'm the owner, I've decided I want to sell my building. I have to approach you, Mr. Tenant, and say, hey, I want to sell my building, make me an offer. Yeah. No, I don't like your and offer. It's not, yeah, it's, and it's not binding at all. Yeah. And it's not binding. And right. so you typically don't want to get into a right of first refusal environment. Yeah, because ever. this can really, because then what happens is, and it, it all depends on how the language is written, what happens is, <clears throat> The owner said, the tenant says, no, I don't like that price, but I have 30 days to counter, right? And then I have 30 days to accept that counter. So you can delay the process by six to nine months. Meanwhile, you have offers on the table that are just sitting there. Mm. So it can really affect the marketability of the building. I, I, versus a, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what I was just gonna say, Alyssa. You know, and again, my experience, everybody's got different experiences. You typically only see on the purchase side these, these type of options where you've got single tenant, or a lot of times where you've done build a suit for lease, you know, where it's really been you as a developer or property owner have been a financing source for somebody. Right. That's typically what you see. You typically would not see, let's say, if AutoNation, I don't know how much they actually occupy in that, in that building. Not much anymore. Okay, but if they occupy 10%, right, they typically aren't going to have a right to purchase that building. Conversely, if it was built for them and they occupied 80 or 90 percent of the original space, it may very well have that type of, uh, of, of option available. Right. And look, it's not always the worst thing in the world. Typically, a tenant can pay you more than an investor for a building. So because you, the cost so you of want to sell to a tenant. Yeah. The cost of relocation is it's huge. Yeah. It's huge, and they don't look at it as an investment, more as a tax structure. So, so there's different motivations that go into tenants buying buildings. Um, so those are the two kind of structures for, for purchase options. Um, I don't know, any other clauses that you think I'm missing? I mean, I think you touched on the important, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you well, got to read every word of the lease, okay? Every word, <laughs> because you never know where clauses are going to be hidden in a lease, and lawyers are, can be tricky. But, um, but I think those are the main things that you want to look for as you're, as you're reading an abstract. Not you want to touch on the physical a little bit. Yeah. Alright, so physical. So again, I'll go back to my experiences as a seller versus versus a buyer. And kind of how my mindset changed um, on the physical side. So physical obviously means the condition of the building that a buyer is going to be buying. You know, the physical plant of the building. It's a uh, certain size, it's was built in a certain year, the mechanical systems are a certain age, they have a certain useful life. So when I was selling buildings, and I'll get into why afterwards, I really, we really took the word of the seller a lot here. Um, if it's an institutional seller, we took the word of the seller. And whatever they represented to us is the condition of the building is what we represented to the market. And I'll tell you why. When you're selling a building for an owner, it's, 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 it's all about expectations. They expect to get a certain price, and they expect for the buyers to have a certain reaction to the building, right? So if the seller tells me that the building is in perfect condition and a buyer is going to walk in and there's no deferred maintenance, I believe him. And then I'll take it to the market and I'll represent that. If a buyer comes back and says, hey, I uncovered this, I can go back credibly to the seller and say, hey, you didn't tell me that the roof you know, had a leak last year. The buyer found it. Now they want a credit at closing, a discount on the purchase price to address it. And I don't lose credibility because he told me that. And that works for institutions. For entrepreneurial owners, you kind of have to do some more of your own diligence when you're selling a property because they'll tend to omit those things. The institutional owner won't because a guy working for a pension fund has a boss, right? So when he decides to sell a building, he's going to an investment committee meeting and saying, this building is going to sell for $50 million. 
if offers come in, and offers come in for 50 million, but then there's a $5 million roof replacement number that he didn't tell his investment committee about, and he didn't tell the broker about, he's gonna look really bad. So mm -hmm. he's gonna disclose everything to you mm -hmm. in all likelihood. Um, so, so that was when I was selling buildings, right? So I took the word of the seller. Sometimes we would do a preemptive property conditions report. So this is a third party report. You hire an engineering company, and they specialize in analyzing the physical structure of a building from the roof <coughs> to the curtain walls, to the floor loads, to the elevator systems, the HVAC systems, the, the fire um, sprinkler systems, all that sort of thing. And they'll give you a report, and that report will typically be, you know, this is what your exposure from a physical standpoint will look like over the next 10 years. Yeah. You said preemptive property report? Yeah, so, so, and this was only in certain cases, when we would sell a building, the seller would say, hey, I want to do, hire a, 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 an engineering firm to do a property conditions report. And this is kind of a market standard, for, especially for institutional owners. Whenever they buy a building, they're gonna do a property conditions report, right? So if you can do it before you sell the building, you can give the market a lot of confidence that whatever you're presenting to them is accurate and they can maybe have a faster due diligence period or you can get the market more excited because there's less risk on the table. And you can build that into your, your cost, cost of sale? You, the seller would build it into his cost of sale. It typically costs about $10,000. We, we, you know, the, the focus of this class really is more as a buyer, but the reality is, is diligence is it's, it's a mirror. And so you can very much take all the tools that you're picking up in this class and put yourself in seller's shoes and say, when I sell an asset, what do I want to do? I want to maximize the value. And in order to maximize the value, you need to understand what the, for example, physical condition of the building is. Right. There's no sense lying to yourself. You can also shortcut a lot of time. Take a large multi-tenant building, you're taking it out to the market. To the extent that you can give the buyers a, a realistic third-party assessment already, it's going to incite a lot more interest. Yeah. Because who's going to spend a lot of money on a building that you don't know what the condition is. You know, imagine, imagine, you know, the building across the street being sold by teachers with a property management or a, 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 a physical property report from a reputable national firm versus a bunch of, you know, single-story warehouses in Sunrise that a guy developed 40 years ago and he's 80 years old and still goes around collecting the rent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it looks bad. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what the condition of it is. You know, you're already going to say, hey, I've got to spend a lot of money. i got to look at environmental here. I might have to spend a lot of money on it. But, you know, there's, there's a, a, a dry cleaner there. There's a gas station on a corner. There's a printing plant in the middle of it. And you say, God knows, I mean, I'm going to have to, like, you know, do a lot of samples here and figure out what the heck's going on. I'm going to have to bring a roofer in here. So the broader the pool of potential buyers, the more transparency, hopefully the higher the price. What happens in an auction? The more people that bid, what have you guys see the Mecham car auctions? Yeah. Right, the guys get in the people's faces and they, they get the excitement going, right? The more people that are bidding, the higher the price. It's human nature. I'm not going to let the ugly guy live with it. I'm not going to bid that guy. You know, people take it personal. The, the bidding process is set up to maximize value. 